and welcome to the MIME Radio Show. I'm Karen Hoyer. And I'm James Donlan. And behind the curtain in the uh, tech basement is Michael Diaz. You won't see his face, but this guy controls our lives. He's the man with the levers, with the buttons, with the uh, gadgets. And we're so happy to have him here. He's like our heartbeat. <laughs> Today, we have Nola Ray as our guest, and I'm really excited to talk to Nola. She's a force of nature from England by way of Australia originally, and uh, she's had an amazing career. Let me read uh, something about her before we welcome her in. Nola Ray was born in Sydney. She migrated with her family to London in 1963 and trained at the Royal Ballet School. She danced professionally in Sweden before studying mime with Marcel Marceau in Paris. She co-founded French-based international research troupe KISS and Friends Roadshow with Django Edwards and was a member of the Bristol Old Vic Company. In 1974, she founded her company, London Mime Theater with Matthew Ridout and has since toured his work to 68 countries worldwide. In 1977, she sparked uh, in her bio, she also says instigated, which is an interesting word in this case, the London International Mime Festival, which was will uh, celebrate its 45th edition in January 2022. Nola's early solo sketch shows mix mime, dance, clowning, puppetry, and controlled lunacy. In 1990, she radically changed her style and began presenting full-length solo comic dramas. She is in demand as a director, acclaimed for turning classic tragedies into clown theater. Broaden your mime. And the Clown Speaks Without Words are Nola's workshops dedicated to letting the body do the talking. She has been the subject of two television documentaries and has received a Total Theater Lifetime Achievement Award and the Charlie Rivel Award for Clowning. In 2008, Nola was awarded an MBE. And for those who don't know what that is, living here in the uh, wilds of the United States, the MBE is the most excellent order of the British Empire an honor bestowed by the Queen of England for Nola's services to drama and to mine. So let's welcome Nola Ray. I hear, there she is. <laughs> it's so good to have you, Nola. I have heard your name so many times over the years and have never had the fortune to uh, see you live, although there's many um, videos that I've peeked at. but. I am so glad you decided to um, honor us with your presence. Oh, thank you. Thank you for honoring me with your presence. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I likewise am very excited, as I said. Um, I was talking to Nola before the show that um, often mimes, particularly physical theater artists in different parts of the world, never are introduced to each other. Back in the golden days, maybe the 70s and 80s, we had lots of festivals. And of course, Nola still. Uh, it, you know, the London Mind Festival is still happening, but that was a great place to network and to meet people. And we find these pockets, of, you know, these legends, these words come out of the mist, you know, and we hear about them, but unfortunately we don't get to see them. So hopefully with the Mind Radio Show, one of our goals was to make it possible for people to be introduced to the great performers and teachers in physical theater of the last 50 years or so. So Nola, I'm always very curious about what artists think right before they start performing. Do you have a little mantra or do you have a particular um, routine that you do to prepare? What goes through your mind? Um, yes, I, I repeat words to myself. Excuse me, I'm gonna cough. <coughs> I don't cough, sometimes I do. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's called, mostly it's concentrate. <laughs> Concentrate. concentrate, 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 energy, stamina. Uh, is that a uh, nervous time for you or is it like a collecting your you powers, to, so to speak? You have to, you have to collect yourself together because mm -hmm. you don't want your mind flying all over the place. So if you say these mantras like concentrate, that's very important to me. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Concentrate, you know, yeah, relax sometimes. No, not, not often do I say relax, but uh, I stamina these are all things i wish to have for the show stamina inspiration um yeah uh accuracy yeah, yeah. another thing did you, <laughs> do you uh i know you're such a power on stage is that 
is there any nervousness or insecurities? Like some people say, oh, I'm always nervous. That's if I'm not, it's a bad thing. Like myself, I was always excited to get on stage. How, how do you feel about that? I'm nervous. I th you know, if I'm not nervous, <clears throat> uh, I'm not, I'm not over nervous usually. When I was younger, I was really nervous. But mm. as I got more, more experienced, I was a little nervous. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you're not nervous before you go on, you don't do a good show. You have mm -hmm. to have some nerves. Mm -hmm. That gives you a frisson uh, uh, when, when you actually get onto the stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the in the uh, day before you have, say, you have a performance in the evening. Do you have a particular routine about? Do you run through the show? Do you rehearse? Do you uh, have a special meal? I have I have my big meal. My big meal is a, is a strong lunch, as my Italian friend said. You, Nola has to have a strong lunch. So I have a big lunch, <laughs> usually around <clears throat> twelve thirty, one o'clock. Yeah, yeah. Um, the evening in Italy, they 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 work so late. You can have it a bit later. Uh, yeah, then yeah. I go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I have, yeah, I that's have, a yeah. So I enjoy I have always enjoyed performing with an empty stomach, and then of course, especially in other parts of the world, there's a tradition of the artists eating after the show, you know, with friends and other people. Is that something you always would? Would well, you go out and have meals and or a, a drink or anything, or have a drink, go yeah. back to your we drink. A What's lot. that? We drink more than yeah, eat. yeah. Oh, I've, yeah, I've <laughs> heard that. that yeah. <laughs> Just a snack. What? Um, what yeah. So you enter the stage, and what that that force in front of you, the public, the audience. What what do they mean to you? What? How do you approach that? I mean, is there? I mean, of course, there's different audiences. Um, uh, but uh, what do you think about that? Who is that out there? Um, I can tell whether an audience is going to be good or bad within about two seconds of, of entering or, or, or a bit of me entering. Sometimes only my hand comes on uh, by their reaction. I either mm -hmm. say, oh, good, we're going to have some fun or, oh, dear, going to have to work at this. This is going to be a challenge. So you can is tell it... there's an atmosphere in the theatre straight away. And some, sometimes it's better than others. Sometimes it's a real slog to actually get anywhere with an audience. But generally, 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 they, they're there to see you. They want to see you and they're going to be positive. Yeah. Very few times do you go on stage when the audience is not going to be positive to you. And, and is say, there, I'm sorry, is there a way that you, since you're a solo performer, you adjust to uh, draw them in? Uh, the great, yes, if, if, they're, uh, if they're good, then you can play. <laughs> What's the, can, uh, go if ahead. they're not, then you have to, don't go any faster. I used, I mean, it's a big mistake to try and get it over with. Mm. <laughs> That's a mistake. Just do your show at yeah, the yeah, pace yeah. you normally should do it. If you do it That's too good fast, advice. you can get even deep, more deeply mired in, in difficulties. So just do your work, do your work, let your work speak for itself. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. What is the, um, like, for example, if you think it's going to be a slog, what is the cue or what is the energy you're getting in the hall or the, uh, you know, in the theater that tells you that this might be difficult? It's is called it silence or is it somewhere? Yeah. Somebody's coughing? What is it? No, no, it's usually silence or, you know, or generally it's silence. Probably mm -hmm. for a mime, I don't like silence, especially from an audience. So yeah, it took me a long time to understand that sometimes a silent uh, audience watching a mime was the fact they were concentrating. Didn't necessarily mean they were indifferent. I don't know if you ever had those thoughts, you know. It's it's true. It's true. Sometimes you think you you go, oh God, they're so quiet. But they, then afterwards they tell you, we really enjoyed that and we were mm, concentrating. Exactly. So it depends. It depends on the audience. Sometimes even on the country you're you're playing in. Um, mm hmm. What, uh, speaking of that, what country would have had maybe the most welcoming audience in your experience? Probably several, but what, can you pick one or two out that the public always seemed really involved? Like for me, it's Mexico. Mexico audiences, Mexico audiences Mexico, are wonderful. Mexico is wonderful to play in. Yeah, Mexico is great. I love Mexico. I love South America. And anywhere mm -hmm. in South America is just wonderful to play. Um, in Europe, Norway, funnily enough, quite popular in Norway. <laughs> They tend wow. to like me over there. 
Italy, France, Spain are uh, countries I really enjoy. I, I enjoy most most countries I really enjoy. Portugal, yes. Mm. All, the, all the European countries like that uh, are very appreciative of this kind of work. Uh, I, the, the times when I had problems was one of the times I guess was Nigeria, <laughs> where I don't wow. think they, yeah Nigeria was a bit they were a bit sort of uh, haughty about why, why are you doing this kind of stuff for us. Uh, wow. <laughs> were you worried about guns and uh, rebels coming into the theaters? <laughs> this was a while ago. This is before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Nigeria came yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Interesting. Um, Nola, I am very, very curious about how you get your um, inspiration and where your work comes from. So you've done a variety of different things, but what's the process? Do you sit for a while and think, or do you get up on your feet with an idea? Where did those wonderful shows come from? Well. When it comes to sketches, they're usually done for about there's about sympathy, revenge, sympathy and revenge are the two reasons to do them. <clears throat> mm. With sketches, generally speaking, generally speaking, with uh, the old the, the the longer shows and the shows that have uh, well, the full length comic dramas as we call them, um, that has to come from an idea, and that idea could come from anywhere. I did my first one of those was called Elizabeth's Last Stand, which is about Queen Elizabeth, the first of England, but not exactly because it's my grandmother trying to be Queen Elizabeth the first <laughs> of England. <clears throat> <laughs> so first of all, to, to get the show and um, to get a feeling for the character of Queen Elizabeth the first, you have to read a lot about her, um, and a lot you, you can you it's it's very interesting, and then you pick out what things about her what that you want to show. I was thinking about doing her religious wars, but that became too mm. difficult. <laughs> I was thinking of doing that in puppetry where you've got the Catholics like you know was would be parrots and and the ravens would be the Protestant but that I uh, that I threw that out. You threw a lot of ideas out. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and eventually she was she was uh, she could dance, she was a good dancer, she had a short temper, she was extremely intelligent. Um <clears throat> She got lonely uh, when she got older because everybody died before her. All her her uh, her mm. courtiers, uh, you know, every people were quite frightened of her. Um, so is that where the the parallel with your your granny came from? My grandmother was absolutely opposite. Ah. <laughs> and the so now I know in your work, especially in the the full length pieces, your your use of puppetry and you know, so many medias and um, mediums and um, uh, wonderful stagecraft, great cotton. I mean, your work is very um, tight, meaning it's like everything fits. You know, it's very kinetic. One thing affects another. But I know you've, you know, when you say you use mime and dance and puppetry, puppetry seems to be something that you use quite a bit in your process. And for yeah. me, puppetry is the, the mind brain and the puppetry, puppet operator brain is the same brain, basically. Yeah. It's, um, the same, it's the same technique, puppetry, and, and it's the same timing and the same, yeah, the same detail in that you move for a puppet, you move slowly and you move, you articulate. If you mm -hmm. move a puppet like this, no one's going to see anything. The other thing about puppetry is you move much slower than you normally would do in real life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. You know, those beginning puppeteers, they're always... You know, the puppets are like rags on their hands or something. And that's know? true with, with um, um, people that are starting out in mime or physical theater. They move too much. They yeah. need to um, slow but, down. So now you, you don't yeah. speak. You I'll know, tell you, do you... About, sorry, about, I have to say about moving and being quick. Marcel Marceau said to us students, you can be just as boring fast as you can slow. <laughs> Great. Wow, that's good. I like now, that. <laughs> you uh you seem to most of your work has been silent. You know, we're talking about process and so forth. I know that the show um about with Shakespeare's uh was had some you spoke in that, but I it seems that most of your work has been without words. Is that correct? Would, would, yeah, would we I, say? Didn't, I didn't speak in uh, Shakespeare the works. I didn't I saw I saw I saw a video where you I saw some like a word here or there. 
are in uh, homemade, homemade Shakespeare, Shakespeare, which is another Shakespeare. With yeah, yeah, no, I think that's the one I'm thinking. Yeah. But then talk I to us about your um, or make sounds. In fact, yes. Yeah, yeah. Talk to us about your choice of to not speak or how powerful silence can be in this process. Well, I, I didn't even think about speaking when I when I first want, was in theatre because I was a dancer. I come up from ballet and ballet dancers don't speak. So I had no reason to think I should speak on stage. Um, the other thing is, if I speak, a lot of roles are, are, are what's the word, are neg negated. Because if I come out playing a masculine role and speak with a very feminine voice, it's not going to work. Mm. I can play many more characters keeping my mouth shut than I would have been able to do if I'd have spoken. Mm -hmm. The moment I speak, I'm female. And generally, a lot of, a lot of well, quite a f mostly, I play ma masculine characters, uh, or androgynous anyway. So that's the other reason. And mm -hmm. there's another reason I don't like my voice. <laughs> <laughs> so I um I think I'm not sure but do you work with the director? Yes. And, and how would you recommend young artists or people that are are seeing their work come to a certain level and they need to get a director, what's the relationship of the solo performer, the physical theater performer with their director? What's how does that work? Well, a lot of the a lot of the sketches that I did in the early days, the, uh, I, I didn't have a director. They were my sketches, and and people who saw them said, "I don't understand that," or uh, <laughs> "That was good," or "Could you do more of this?" Uh, but the the later shows did have a director. Uh, but what you what you want what I do uh, to to create a show, uh, whether it be a sketch or whether it be a longer piece, is to work it out work out what I'm trying to do. So I make a story, I tell a story, even if I even write it down like a story. Mm. And then I try and do it. Mm -hmm. If I think it works as a story, um, it's generally, it will work generally a, as a piece of mime or clowning. Sometimes mm -hmm. not, but uh, generally it will. So first of all, I study hard. If, I, if I'm doing a, a historical character like Elizabeth I, Mozart, or Napoleon, I study that a lot. And that seems to actually it seems to get into your bones, what you hear about or what you read about these characters. And then you're able to, well, it's quite difficult, then you're able to express their characters much more easily. Um, there's a lot of rehearsal goes on. Uh, I like to rehearse with props and costumes, even if I haven't got them. Mm. I, I will do, uh, you know, I will do mock costumes and mocks, mock, I'll mock up. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll, if they, they work mocked, then I'll make them properly or get wow. them made properly. That's another thing we do. We also toss out, we say, you know, we say we want this and we want that and I want this and that. And then we, the director comes along and goes, you don't need that, you don't need this, you don't need that. <laughs> and mm -hmm. right down to, the, to its essence, in fact. And this is what in my is, it's the essence and clowning, the essence of something. You don't need to be too fussy. Uh, so is your, is your director sort of like an editor is to a writer? Um, my director, the one I work mostly with, is John Moat, who is a mime. He he's now he, he's, he directs a lot of a lot of work, not just mm -hmm. mimes, uh, but he was he he is he is a mime himself, um, and and he's very strange because he never writes anything down. I show him my script, and he goes, "Yeah," <laughs> <laughs> and he watches. Uh -huh. No, sometimes he falls asleep, in fact, but he watches. And then he'll get up and he'll do things. He'll just move. And then he'll say, what you should do is this. You know, watch it, you try that. And he'll throw ideas at me. Okay. And I said, just, just try this idea, just do it. And it's, it's improvisation then. It comes up mm -hmm. with improvisation. And, and I say, no, that doesn't work. He said, you're right, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> But he's feeling it in his body to put it into your body. Yeah, yes, he's, he's, he's straight. I don't know many, uh, <clears throat> many uh, 
Oh, I do. I, I suppose I must do it myself when I direct because I, I direct without. Well, there's nobody speaking, so I can't actually say you didn't pronounce this word properly. I have to get up there and say you missed this bit, and I, I do it for them. <coughs> but generally, I do what I I want them to do. <laughs> now you yeah. um you say you uh, you've chosen a lot of masculine characters. Now I think I happen to think that women have the most power on stage. I think a female performer um, or using whatever those sensitivities are or <laughs> forces are, I think they're very powerful on stage, it, more so than men. And I think it's very interesting that you, as a woman that you were uh, prolific in a, you know, very often a kind of stereotypical man's art form, the, the mime, especially in the last century, yes, the, the masculine right. world. And so I'm feeling that you're, because you're a woman and you've chosen characters like Napoleon and, you know, Queen Elizabeth, who probably was all the sexes together, that force of nature. Mozart. Yeah. yeah. But that you're, um, that you were empowered, to, you you gave more power to those figures by the nature that you were a woman. I'm just, I, I, th I find that fascinating. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think it's also because it's revenge from my point of view. It's some <laughs> characters are something you can stick the knife into uh, so <clears throat> that gives you a motivation to play men um, yeah. you, you couldn't do the same and you maybe you can now but you couldn't do the same in my day you didn't have characters you could stick the knife into who were female mm -hmm. but you want to stick the knife in that how did you navigate how did you navigate through that man's world like in the 80s or 70s in, ter in terms of mime is that was, what was that like? difficult? Did you have a hard time? Um, no, because I, you, you have a hard time because of what you think um, <clears throat> or how you feel. Uh, and I come from ballet. I, 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 and the ballet, the ballet dance, the ballerina, the ballet dancer, the female ballet dancer is the person everybody comes to, see, which is you know. In, in my day at least, not, not anymore, because now we've got great masculine dance, male dancers, and, and there's a parity. But in my day, they wanted to see the ballerina, and so there was mm. no way I'm going to feel inferior to any man. So, mm. <laughs> again, you're not just feeling about that. Who? Oh. Wait, do you hear that? Oh, uh, oh, oh, yes. Laura, it's time for your gift. <laughs> you have a package? Yeah. The gift music. Yeah. Uh, yes. Can you open the, up your it's, package? It's the elf in the corner. Are you ready? Head in the They're blocked. So Nola, this is a package from the Mime Museum. Our curator, Michael Diaz, unfortunately thinks we've got too much stuff. So he's de-acquisitioning and sending stuff back to the artists. So it's just a little gift from us. And I think there might be on the top of the box something that tells you what it is. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, two Nola Ray. Right. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> oh, you. It's got a little, uh, can I open a string? <laughs> Souvenir. A crushed and destroyed mime flower. <laughs> From the stage after an early performance of London, no, uh, of no, 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 Careful, yeah, wait, there it ah. is. So is there a mime flower in there? It's uh, yeah. completely destroyed, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any remorse for crushing all those flowers over the years? Uh, yeah. <laughs> if anyone hasn't seen this little mime piece of Nola's nasty mime, it's like one of my very favorites because it sets us up for this beautiful mime tradition and well you know why i did i have a reason to do i saw i saw a student of marceau is an old student of marceau in berlin on the television I went, oh. 
uh, and he he had uh, very black frizzy hair, nothing, a little nappy like thing. And he did all sorts of cliches. He found a flower. He had a child growing up. He, I thought, mm. hmm, this is my revenge. Don't forget, <laughs> yeah, it's um, wonderful that piece. Do you have there's even some archetypal there's some the kind of archetypal Marceau movements and then she and the flower are all very cliched. So I thought I'd just get my my uh, own back on on them so that's the reason for that i probably would never have thought of doing it had i not seen that terrible mine on television in berlin it wouldn't have occurred to me so that's, interesting that's how that's how ideas come mm -hmm. yeah do you feel there's a little bit of the devil or the the little bit of devilish uh mischief in you because in that piece particularly you you, you glance at the audience and your eyes are wonderful there's this like this <laughs> this the well, spirit that, that's hey, what are you what are you laughing at yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you're very, that, very mischievous how was that taken in the day that that kind of irreverent piece did you have any uh they really feedback liked, no the audience well i think um they generally liked it except one dutchman who said some people like flowers <laughs> <laughs> And butterflies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell us about some influences uh, in your early days. So, the, how you were influenced to take the pathway that you did. Um, well, I I was a dancer. I was working in Malmo in Sweden at the the, the State Theatre, and, and Marcel Marceau came there. Now, I I had known uh, about six months before that he was going to open a school. And I decided by that time that I would like to do, I didn't want to stay in this company being a ballet dancer anymore. So I wondered what I could do with the technique of ballet, which is so difficult to learn. It is really, you know, really the ultimate technique and not the voice. And it seemed to be mine. Mm. So when he came to my theatre, I, uh, I was terribly nervous, but I eventually asked him, could I come to your school in September? And he said, we, oui. <laughs> <laughs> he just said, yes. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I worked away to try and, and uh, went, went to Denmark to earn some more money in the Tivoli Pantomime Theatre, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and eventually I got to Paris. And he said, ah, oh, we, oui, le petit Swed, the little Swedish girl. <laughs> <laughs> he thought you were Swedish? Yes, because <laughs> yeah, he saw me. He, you remember he saw me in Sweden, so I, I was for a little while uh, the Swedish girl. <laughs> um, but then he, he he did find out I was Australian uh, at that point uh, or British, and my landlady <clears throat> uh, she called me always la petite Canadienne. She thought I was Canadian. Mm. So, but uh, he he found out we we became uh, Maso and I we, we we were good friends, and whenever he performed in London. We came to see him and we went out with him and uh, he was a, one, a wonderful, wonderful uh, performer and a hugely good teacher, very sort of humane, human, humane, mm -hmm. <laughs> human teacher. He no, never, yeah, he, uh, go ahead, yeah. So he never, you, you, would, you would work and, and everybody was, was amateur, amatore, well, they were really amateur, you know, not very good, most of us were terrible. And we did the most horrible exercises for him, but he would always step up and say, now, I like the way you did this, and this was very nice. And there you go, but, and then he'd do it himself, and we would go. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Ah. And that's how he taught us, with, with great sort of, he didn't lose his temper, he didn't ever go, I am the great uh, Marceau and you are nothing, uh, never. He was always very, very fair and very generous. So uh, now, he, now Marceau is known in some quarters that you know it's, there's this romantic lyrical quality to him, and then your style, it, like we've talked about, revenge and irreverent and and uh, breaking the mold. How did that? How, where did this uh, rebellious quality in you come out of that environment, the Marceau environment, which was this other, I think, this other kind of quality that was being 
presented to you? Well, I, I didn't want to be a small version of Marceau. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I decided that quite early on. Um, I wanted to make my own uh, style, as it were, and, and choose material that is of, from me. Because uh, Marceau, he's, he's, he's had about a hundred different ideas. Uh, I wish I'd have written them down because I might be trying them. But <laughs> he, he had a hundred ideas, he liked about twenty. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had to, I couldn't do his, I, I didn't want to do his ideas and he'd taken up quite a lot of the best ones actually. Uh, mm. I had to rethink and, and do ideas that, that were from my experience. Mm -hmm. So one of the early pieces was the ballet. Uh, that's a revenge piece, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and the conductor, the conductor is another one. That's another revenge piece. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They're, so, they're wonderful. Um, I, unfortunately, we have to take a little break here because I have to leave. Um, but I know that James has a ton of other questions to answer. So we're going to continue the conversation. Nola, I, uh, my dream is to come to London and, and uh, see the London Mime Festival. I would love to see one of your shows in person when it's allowed to travel and so forth. But I am uh, so thrilled to have spent a little bit of time with you. And I will let you continue the uh, interview. So goodbye for me. Okay, guys, we'll take a little break and we'll be back in probably five seconds or a split second. The magic of editing <laughs> okay here we are so yeah like makeup hair makeup <laughs> yeah, especially hair yeah yeah, yeah. i'm Same assuming we can just all right yeah i'm feeling lonely now it's the first time we've had these problems where now it's just you and me um i'm assuming we can just start again uh where were we we're talking about uh yeah yeah that mix of uh yeah not being under the shadow of, of Marcel Marceau. Yeah. Not, not being his little shadow. Um, did it, did it, was it, did you find your style or your approach pretty quickly when she had made that decision? Uh, I, probably, probably I was, I think so. Uh, I was using what he taught me anyway, the technique or what, he, he was not the only teacher at his school, by the way. His, his, uh, his ex-wife, uh, Ella was teaching uh, Tomasevsky type mime, which is very, oh. very athletic. Um, yeah, yeah, I know really that style. So, yeah. Good technique, and uh, she was the main technique teacher. We had Pierre Verri, who uh, who was his, uh, in fact, the principal of his school. Uh, he taught us. Did he teach? Work. Did Pierre Verri teach her? Yes, mask work yeah. and uh, yeah. other things. And we had a dance teacher, an acrobatics teacher. And we even had a fencing teacher. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a conservatory. Yeah. So this was a big influence on you, this experience. And then what other, are there any childhood experiences that might have influenced you? Like, did you grow up in wide open spaces? Or, or you were from no, Sydney. I grew, but... I grew up in, in Sydney. I'm a city slicker. Uh, yeah. But I, of course, ballet, ballet was the big thing in Australia. I went to see all the big companies there. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, but... Our, our whole family was very fond of, of the silent comedians in particular, comedians in general. Mm -hmm. We like to think of ourselves as connoisseurs of that. <laughs> oh, great. Fantastic. So I had a background, even in Australia, mm. of things that were funny and, and comedians and silent movies and and uh, Charlie Chuck, Buster Keaton, yeah, 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 yeah. Jack Tati even, uh, even in Australia. Pierre yeah, I've Tati always appreciated uh, yeah. Australian film because it's very gritty usually it's very gritty and very you know the flies are on the red meat very often and it, you know there's a lot of visceral no, no. artistic work that comes out of australia so i'm thinking some of that kind of quality may have influenced you to take the path you did you know to I break away also, from... i think also that our humor is quite black if you're australian uh -huh. a much darker sense of humor than Americans do, or or even Marceau. Marceau doesn't have a particularly dark sense of humor. Yeah, yeah, you're right. What so, um, we do. And you never went back. You never had made a choice oh, to go back to Australia. We did we did several tours, big ones? Uh -huh. yeah, Australia. We have been back, yes. But you felt at home in uh, in England all these years. Yes, I like Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. I like the fact you can go across the water and you've got a new language. You Absolutely. Your, uh, things to see, you know. Do you have any disaster story? I know you've done such amazing amount of touring. Do you have any disaster stories uh, that come to mind that 
might be interesting and fun to hear about from your uh, sojourns. Mm. Oh, well, well, trying to get out of Beirut was fun. Oh. <laughs> During the war. Uh -huh. um, in Beirut, we went to Beirut. Uh, the British Council sent us there and said, if they don't survive this, if, if you know, we won't work with them again. If they do, we might think about it because wow. it was a very dangerous place to be. We did uh -huh. a, I must admit, we did a really wonderful show uh, at the American University, which was then after bomb to the ground. Uh, and then we tried to get out because we were working in the north side of Cyprus. Uh, well, first of all, there's a terrible rainstorm. <laughs> Beirut was flooded. Uh, secondly, the Israelis had strafed uh, some of the Palestinian uh, camps nearby. Wow. Uh, uh, it was a, it was a, no, there was a buff, bus that had been blown up with his, Israelis in, the, in it. And so mm. everybody knew in Beirut that there was going to be revenge. Wow. Actually, we got to we got to the airport, checked our bags in. Um, everybody was looking looking up the sky to see when the Israelis were going to strafe. Mm. Uh, we went to the, went to the plane, our plane to Cyprus, um, and they said, "Where are your bags?" And they weren't there. So Matthew looked around and he saw our bags going off to an Egyptian flight. <laughs> on one of these trolley things and he ran uh, and he took them luckily we only had a couple two bags he ran uh, ran back threw them into the hold and we were pushed up the stairs um, mm. we, we weren't even sitting down before the plane the plane took off amazing so we rained it we uh, then arrived in uh, uh, Nicosia and then we had to get across to the other side of uh, the Turkish side <clears throat> of Nicosia because we were playing for the uh, the Turkish president of the Nicosia, the uh, Cyprus, Turkish. Yeah, yeah. President. So you were really at the intersection of politics and war and yes, but you know we, the, all those things that humanity does to make things difficult. Um, we, we also played in Beirut. Uh, we played in Beirut. We played in uh, Baghdad during the war there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what did. now? Syria. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you've done a lot of work in the Middle East in that part of the, yes. the world, that Eastern because Mediterranean. The place there is Egypt. Egypt is just really wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Which is Egypt's just stuff. kind of a, yeah. what, uh, what's yeah. the most unusual uh, country you've performed in? An unusual, not in a negative way, but just the most uh, adventurous and the most delightful, well, you know, not another place on earth what 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 are what are some what's a place like that maybe you performed we performed in greenland <laughs> oh wow <laughs> quite interesting <laughs> and what about the stage what what is there any kind of interesting quirky stage you might or playing space you may have uh, encountered on your, in your travels oh well, we had a lot of dumps and dives you know yes <laughs> yeah yeah I remember performing and uh, doing a what, touring a one man show in Ireland, and they encouraged me to drink Guinness during the performance because it was in a pub, and I quite enjoyed that because I like Guinness. And uh, but that I'd never experienced that before, getting a little buzz during the show, you know, like. But it was all good crack, as you say, you know. Yeah, so but, uh, we we went to Dublin once to to perform in the Project Theatre, which is behind the Olympia Theatre, where, where Marceau played in the big theatre, the Project. Was. Uh -huh. Anyway, we parked there and everything, went to the hotel, which is very nearby. And uh, the, the, uh, the director, the producer, uh, came at nine o'clock and summoned Matthew down to the bar. And he had a couple of Guinnesses there, nine o'clock in the morning. We normally wouldn't turn. Uh, yeah, it's breakfast, right? <laughs> yeah. so we, we, got a few, we got a few little problems. We got a few problems. Yeah. <laughs> What, so you're comfortable, are you comfortable in most any kind of playing space or do you have uh, standards no, or? No, but the, the, the fact that with this particular story, our theater had caught fire. <laughs> uh, Project theater. During the caught, performance? No, before that night, the, uh, oh, the wow. lighting box had gone up. So don't, don't worry, your, your stuff's all right. It's a bit wet. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, the, the world of, I mean, I've fallen off the stages when the black art was wrong, all kinds of things. Let's talk about teaching. I know you do workshops. And I know for me, I feel one of the missions of a physical theater artist of a mind particularly is to teach. I feel that we're kind of like, uh, uh, what's the word? I can't think of the word now, but we, you know, spread the, spread the concept, spread the, you know, I think Marceau said there's a quote that I saw from him once that for the lack of schools and creators and art dies, there's a quote attributed to Marceau of that nature. So I've always felt my teaching and my performing were go went hand in hand that the, and it was, I enjoy the teaching and I'm sure that uh, you've seen amazing uh, performances in a studio that the public will never see from, you know, that great innocent place that students can get into and the moments that happen. Can you uh, talk to us a little bit about your teaching philosophy or why you do it and maybe it's important or not? What, what do you think? Um. I think it's I think it's important. I, I enjoy teaching, though it depends on the students, of course. If I have yeah, you're students, only as good as your students, they say, I you know, as a teacher. Enjoy it. <laughs> but if I've yeah. got students or students at least, they don't have to be greatly talented, but they have to be enthusiastic. Mm. And they have to try. If I see anybody not trying, I'm not gonna like them. Um, mm -hmm. and my philosophy is not to say too much. Um, mm. Yeah, not let them do the work. Yeah, not to over explain when I'm, I, I do demonstrate, uh, but usually in silence. Mm -hmm. um, I don't explain you put you put your hand on your fingers and like this. No, no, you have to. Mm -hmm. follow. Mm -hmm. And if and do you if make a mistake, I just stare at them. <laughs> um, and they go, oh, and they, you know. <laughs> Is it an enjoyable experience for you? Do you feel that there's a place for this? this yes. uh, effort that you're doing yes it, it, it is enjoyable it's quite tiring i find teaching i mean i love teaching but i find it sometimes even more tiring than doing a show well it's no i, I agree i think a good class uh is a is like a performance in terms of the timing and the, how you, you have to be aware of the circumstances and you have to communicate you have to keep your energy it's a total performance yeah, i always yeah. felt that my teaching informed my performance because I had to think out what my philosophy was and vice versa. The performance helped help me have stamina and awareness in the classroom. So I think they, for me, they go hand in hand. Um, and, you know, like you were saying how much of an influence Marceau had on you. And of course I had mentors in my, my, my lifetime. And so I, you know, that passing down the knowledge is really important because that's how the next generations are born. I would assume, you know, so and it's it's a uh, mime is is very fragile. There's not a lot of people who teach it. Exactly. And, and it's you could put people off by doing it badly. I just like, like uh, yeah. Not you. It's not the same. If you're a bad mime, people won't want to see mime again. It's very absolutely. Strange. Yeah, they don't give it a chance. It's if it's that's what it is. They yeah. shut off immediately. Yeah. They say, oh, I didn't like that mime. I'm not going to. I'm not going to go. They don't say that about acting, dancing, singing, uh, even, you know, no, they don't say that. Oh, that was a horrible actor. I'm never going to see acting again. No, but, but with yeah, mine, yeah, yeah. And to a certain extent, clowning as well. Yeah, yeah. So, well, it comes down to the material again, doesn't it? I mean, that those ideas are so important in the end. You know? it's, it's too bad that mime has become kind of, over the decades, has become kind of stereotypical and not the adventurous imagination places, you know. You've got to draw them in very quickly right at the beginning, which Marcel was the master of doing. You know, he, he started with a very simple sketch, but a very funny one, generally the sculptor, uh, mm -hmm. where he had a great big block of, uh, I could see it, it's of course there's not there, a big block of marble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's doing the thinker and then he has an idea. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. He picks up his uh, chisel and hammer, and he he uh, with his feet he he uh, makes. Yeah, his... there's that that lyrical. Uh, I was I was thinking uh, in terms of your performance, how your ballet and your love of music and time has really influenced your work. But that's a that thing you're talking about with Marceau is a good example of that time and space yeah, element. The funny thing about Marceau, he chips chips this great block of marble down to this size. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He goes ping, and then back to the thinker again, and then that's the end of the sketch. No, that's yeah, yeah. a beautiful sketch. It's 
it's easy to see uh, and as he goes on through the show he, he gives his audience things that are much more uh, what's complex so he, he starts very simple and he works his way up to a more com complexity right so he's educating his audience right from the beginning and this is something you've got to think about you when you what come um on, yeah go ahead what when you come on you you don't generally you don't come in bells and whistles and yeah there i am you come on much slower than that and much quieter because if you come on all bells and whistles and big and ah, there's nowhere to go you can't go anywhere yeah absolutely but um then there's a quote i saw a quote, i was doing some research on you yesterday and there's a quote that you said you, that you said that there was a famous director said to you once that mine would be the death knell of theater yeah. And you said something like, uh, uh, well, it's unfortunate that people who should know better that should know. And um, what, what, I'm just wondering how that has um, influenced you over the years, this, I, you know, this kind, you know, we're talking about mime and the stereotypical qualities it can get into, like, how do we, how do you combat that? that point of view because that's not that's a common point of view by quite a few people that are should know better but a lot of critics <clears throat> in the early days a lot of critics wouldn't come to mine even though there's a, a festival there they wouldn't come because they think oh that's circus we don't we don't uh, <laughs> do circus or yeah know. it's the low art yeah the base <laughs> art to, to get it publicized um it was generally by word of mouth only in those days and yeah. we were sold out we were sold out from the first festival because people said, God, oh, uh, and then of course there was one critic from the Daily Telegraph who happened to be a Canadian, happened to be a writer on about ballet, and who came and saw it, and gave us mm. great reviews uh, in the yeah, in yeah. big paper. And then yeah, they just start, they start coming, and, uh, <clears throat> but there's still some of them that that have no understanding of mine whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, the form, for me, the form is so eclectic, meaning that you have to be able to do so many things well, move and your sense of command of the space and your ideas and your precision and your economy. And, you know, the good minds, the ideas come forward and the, all that technical stuff, you know, is serves the idea. And it's, so, you know, there's so much training that's gone into it that the, the ease of the technique, it, you know, yeah. is disguises the fact that it's, hard work and and also i'm feeling a little bit of the criticism comes from people that are just intimidated by what you know goes into becoming a mind you know um it's uh it's not for everybody i mean a mind no a uh, mind and a clown i must say has to be born i think i yeah i think you're right and then the the teacher or the influences just reveal the the yeah. inner jewels you know just how do you open the door in other words yeah. Yeah. But I think that mime itself, though, is really, if to, to learn it anyway, whether you're going to be Marcel Marceau or a mime, is really, is really good as part of our, one of the arrows in your quiver. Absolutely. <laughs> because it, it so helps, it so helps you as a performer, no matter what kind of performer you are. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I have a long history of working in high level drama schools and I was usually the performance and movement teacher and I find that most acting students appreciate their voice teacher and their movement teacher above the acting teachers and of course the movement class is has elements of the pure mind but it's also just the sense of the that world and it it's so valuable as a base for acting in general you know it's yeah. it's the consummate the clown you know I always feel the clown is the consummate actor you know, yes. and the mime just takes the specialty, some specialties a little further. Well, a clown uses mime as well. I mean, a clown. Oh, yeah, the, a clown is a mime, yeah, and vice versa. Yeah, they're sisters. Or, yeah, sisters. absolutely. Yeah, that's, it's funny. Now, I was, I was, whoa. Oh, no. It's getting hot in here. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what that sound is, but it's time for rapid fire. It's rapid fire time, Nola. This is another little interlude that we're going to play with you. Uh, <laughs> it's called rapid fire, which means I'm going to give you a phrase or a word. And I want you, if you were, if you would enjoy this, to give me a, a, an answer back. Like it's a word association, right? So if I said, for example, um, tree, you might say roots, you know, for example. All right. You can respond verbally or you can respond 
physically only with no words, or you can do both at the same time. Okay. So I'll just give you a fun list here and we'll uh, take this adventure together a little bit. All right. Are you game for this? <laughs> she has no choice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so rapid fire. I'll just give you a list here and you respond as quickly as you can in the moment, either physically or verbally or both. Okay. Ready? Future. Uh, distance. Feet. Clompers. <laughs> Arms. Uh, arms, knees, and boomster daisy. <laughs> <laughs> Stage. Stage, platform. Costumes. Costumes, stuff. <laughs> Red nose. Red nose. Power. <laughs> mm. Clown. Power. <laughs> Mime. Power. Past. Past. Uh, sadness sometimes. <laughs> I, child. Child. Little person that should behave itself. <laughs> <laughs> Age. Something that comes to everybody if you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That was great. Okay. Hey, speaking of age, let's talk just a little bit about the aging mind. Okay. So I'm 74, as I told you, and I've had to adjust, you know, if, 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 especially if I want to keep performing as you went through the years, what kind of adjustments would you have made? Or how does, how does one approach, you know, aging as an artist, any kind of artist, because, you know, I, I, I think you agree that there's some wonderful artists that even more wonderful than ever that when they're, older in years, you know, what, how does, how do we approach that? How do we um, adapt to that as we go through our careers as artists? Uh, it took me quite a while as an, as, as I got older, I learned to actually move with less stress because mm -hmm. the more stress you move with, uh, the less, the less, the more exhausting everything is. So for a while I learned to move uh, accurately, but with less stress. So I think, in that way, I, I was a better artist. Then we went past all that, whereby yeah. movement at all became much more difficult. I broke my kneecap in 93, uh, 93 break your knee in 93, uh, which <laughs> stopped me from running and jumping. And, and you know, uh, so I had to adjust. You have to adjust. As you get old, you adjust, 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 until eventually, um, all this adjustment is just like too much hard work. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you go, that's, that's it. I cannot do this show, uh, for instance, as well as I want to do it. So you and feel there's an eventual, you know? there's an eventual time limit to the, to the life of the mime or the clown, the physical yeah. artist. Is there a, how would one push through that if they wanted to continue? Do you think the lack yeah. of physical skills, uh, well, of course, um, any, 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 what's the word, really hard physical work, like a dancer, there is a, there's a time when you can't do it anymore. Yeah. Physically, you can't do it. And the same goes for mine. And it, the same would go for clowning too. You can't physically do it. Your body doesn't mm -hmm. get you. So they, therefore, you know, that, that's when that time comes. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it comes. So you feel... You feel that one should just go to another chapter and not try to adapt further in terms of mental approach. Like I always felt uh, aging for a physical theorist was like an hourglass. And so in the beginning of life, the physical side is up here and the mental side is down here. The physical side, well, let's say, let's put it the other way, the physical side is full, right? The mental side is empty in the beginning. We take, as we get older, we turn it over and the physical starts to drain into the mental but the volume remains the same. So for example, whatever leaves here ends up here, but in a different form, eventually, like you say, you know, you throw it over your shoulder, yeah. but uh, you know, that's one of the ways I've approached it um, through that, that, that journey that we're taking. Um, you know, that I, I, I appreciate that element of timelessness. 
You know, the one thing we've spoken a lot about Marceau, one thing I've always appreciated about him was actually in the blackouts of his performances, because you could still see his luminous white costume just faintly in the darkness, right? And when the sh he would be doing his thing and then the blackout would come and you'd see this almost like a ghost drifting very slowly off stage, you know, conserving that energy like you talked about. Yes. And Pierre Verri or somebody would hold the title card That's and then right. you'd see the the ghost slowly walking, conserving that energy back in the ritual to the stage, and then it would start again. You know, I found that very fascinating in that a way yeah. of you know, capturing the energy and putting it in another place. He, was, he had he had no um, stress in the way he worked, uh, Marcel. He never did have. I had plenty of stress. Every movement was there uh, <laughs> until I learned differently. I learned differently. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, with, without all the stress, but he had it right from the beginning, and he had a very long, uh, long performance life. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. He, I saw. Uh, I uh, spent yeah. some time with him. I think about it six months before he died, and he was still had that yeah. sparkle in his eye. Yeah. So you feel the fire's gone out for you in a sense. Do you? Uh, what keeps some of the embers you know, burning? It's not go, gone out. A good idea will set me going again. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The thing that's gone out is this this constant touring um, on the road. Yeah. That's but your um, mind is still very vividly alive, right? I mean, yeah. you like you like directing, I'm assuming, and teaching yeah. your workshops. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's say I might I might never perform again. It just depends what. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. What about legacy? What are your feelings on the legacy of the artist? The legacy. Um, yeah, is that important to you? Like, what that people remember you? Uh, you know, after you know years from now, it's, uh, well, it's uh, like, how do you approach that? If like I've made my stand, like, how do you feel about that? It's okay if we forget about it, or is it in a dusty book on the shelf, or what? What do you think? I, I have no idea. I've, I've been trying to actually. Uh, I would like to leave stuff, uh, pictures, and posters with the Victorian Albert Museum, uh, which uh -huh. has a theater, a theater section in london i think that might be a good resting place for a lot of stuff from me whether it's ever get gets seen i don't know but mm -hmm. that would be nice rather than chuck it out into a you know into a bin yeah uh, yeah so you, you are interested in that people have taken are influenced by you and have taken your treasures and uh, can adapt them to their own worlds right just like marceau would have done yes uh, i think i think people i i can't think that people um, like they've done with Marceau, they don't, that I know of, they don't imitate me. <laughs> That's that I good. I don't know if they do or not, that I know of. Yeah, yeah. But there's a yeah, lot yeah, of yeah. Marceaus out there who are on street corners with the white gloves and the white makeup doing Marceau stuff. And I said to Marceau once, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of little Marceaus out there. And, and he said, well, maybe, but what can I do about it? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He was quite what um, what advice would you give to young people today that it would are interested in mime and clown and or the mixture of that? A clown is you. A mime is you. It's you. It's your personality. Say that again. Say that again. A mime and a clown. A mime and a clown is your personality. It's, it's your you. personality. It's you. It's it's you very much so. Though Marcel used to say, "Well, my 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 uh, character Beep is very naive." Mm -hmm. I am not naive, but I think in a way he was <laughs> naivety about him, uh, which was nice, which is one of the characteristics you loved him for. Um, but it's really you and it's up to you to make yourself an interesting person. If you're interesting as a person, you have much more chance of being interesting as a performer. Mm. So does that mean that one should follow their 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 uh, their dreams and or or just yeah. know themselves sit in a sit under a tree on on the coast uh, and and re meditate or both well, you know i don't know about meditate meditating but i think you know i think you've got to go out there and take things you know enjoy not not just enjoy life but have some life and it, and, and, and try things out experiment. yeah let's have a drink yeah so don't say no to things uh, experiment if they don't work they don't work you've learned yeah. something you know, so uh, experimentation is something a young person it would be good to do. Um, and what uh, do you do? You have any uh, advice for what 
formal challenge a young person might take, like a particular, you know, school or a particular workshop or a particular place to live for a certain amount of time? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I would say for, for a young person, um, go and learn mine if you could find someone to teach it to you, but learn other things too. It all fits in, you know, acrobatics, it's all going to help you. Even speaking, singing, yeah, yeah. learning things, and they will feed into, into your work. Yeah, I've always felt that um, language or voice is a gesture and movement is a voice. I've always looked at, they're both, mu both muscular and they both use breath. I've always felt there was an interchange there. Um, the problem is that, that words are confusing. They have double meanings. Yeah. But it isn't. It can be yeah, confusing, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, if you don't do it properly. But words don't tell you the, necessarily tell you the truth. Words are slippery things, whereas slippery, yeah. Time, there are can't. barriers. There are barriers to words too. You know, like languages and yeah, language certain... is a barrier. It's definitely a barrier. But I like yeah. so I said that. I do like words. I love Shakespeare. I don't like me saying them, but I do. It's not that I'm against words. Yeah, yeah. You can be more truthful as a clown or a mind that doesn't speak. Um, because you don't have this extra barrier to get over. You can make sounds if you like as a clown. People are going to understand you basically uh, without that particular barrier. And, and what you do would go straight to the heart if you don't speak and you, and you don't have the audience go, what did she mean there? Uh, it's, if, if you're good at what you do, it goes, goes to the audience's heart. Yeah, yeah. How would you, um, how do you define we haven't talked about this yet. How do you define what you've done? Like, I mean, I don't want to say how do you define mine because every every approach is different. But how how would you define your art in an economical way? Um, what would that? What is it? Well, I've got a really nice story. Which it was in India. I was playing in uh, I think it was Delhi, and I was a overheard. It was a little boy uh, who'd been to the show and his friend asking about it. And the friend said, what's he like, this Nola Ray? And the, 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 child, the child had seen she said, well, for, it, for, for, for first thing, it's a girl. And what does, what does she do then? Well, sometimes she's a clown and sometimes she's a Nola Ray. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes she's a Nola Ray. Wow. <laughs> So, so that, in one sense, it's indescribable in terms of a you know conventional academic definition. It's it's your spirit, yes, culminating I mean, in a physical world. Yeah. I mean, like any actor, I suppose it's you know it's, he's Laurence Olivier and he acts like Laurence Olivier. It's you know uh, it, it's anything. so you don't differentiate. So, in other words, the the which has been problematic for mime and clown, you know, people, you know, in our world, I was going to say this earlier, our world today packages things like the layman, the lay person needs to have kind of a, like a cereal box in front of them to see what it is, you know? And in, in, even though we know that mime and clown are, are so eclectic with all the influences and the, the, the things that go into that. I think um, it's hard to actually give, give them a good definition because they're in, in their heads, they think that a clown is McDonald's clown and works in the circus and gives out yeah, yeah. Uh, and it isn't uh, and as, and as I say it can be but it's not it's a big broad church all, all these arts so what you've got to do is get the audience to think beyond the box um, mm -hmm. that's yeah I was going to say that, that see we were talking about how language is is a, has barriers well there you go the word mime the word clown presents a barrier yeah and you said that well I'm no Ray, so that's more ethereal and more esoteric than the word mime or clown, which is the that yeah. proves the point that yeah. you know the the there's no limit to the universal. Like we're talking very esoterically, or there's no limit to that universal truth of being in the mime form, whatever that yeah. is, you know. Um, it, but it, the same goes for lots of artists, you know, where they do their yeah. things who they are, and you go to see them doing their things because they are who they are. Uh, even though they remain who they are in their roles a lot of the time. Actors. Yeah. Um, so if they, you're at a party, 
and uh, someone asks you, well, Nola, what do you do for a living? What would you say to them? I say, I'm a mime. And they go, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then how would you describe that? Oh, I say, I say, oh, you mean you, you work on the streets and you do those statue things? <laughs> yeah, 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 the statue thing. <laughs> No, I work in the theater. <laughs> yeah, uh, mime is a, that's one of my missions today is to make sure young people know that mime is a theater art and, you know, it belongs in the theater, not just in the street. I mean, it's, uh, it's so tragic that that's kind of gone by the wayside in the recent I, decades. I mean, Marceau started very small. You can tell the students that he started in cafe theaters in Paris, little, little cafe theaters. He said, yeah. It took him 10 years to get the audience quiet. And because they, not that they didn't like what he was doing, and it must have been much shrunken because yeah. of the space he was in, it's because they, they had never heard silence before, anybody working with silence. So they used to whistle. Huh. Not... Wow. He said it took 10 years, he's told me this, 10 years to get them quiet. And after, after a while, he burst out of the cafe theatre because mine, his type of mime anyway, played in vast theatres. He played in thousands right. of big yeah, yeah. theatres. Uh, yeah. But he started very small in the cafe theatre. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure he ever started on the street, though. Apparently, uh, during the war, he was on the street. Uh, he was uh, helping, uh, he was in the resistance, and he was well, that, leading yeah. Jewish children into Switzerland. So. I dare say he did quite a bit of mine on the street at that time. Well, to, that's the challenge, isn't it? Um, is to get young people to understand that you don't need to be in a big theater or a big, you know, opera house to start your career. You know, it can start in the most humble beginnings, you know, and that's, I think a lot of younger people are very discouraged and get depressed. Well, I haven't made it, or I, but there, there's this chrysalis of genius that you can find yeah. anywhere you know like a music you know, like a mime is like a great musician you can make music anywhere well, and started, as long as the quality is there I started, on the street I started on the street yeah 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 sketches on the street <clears throat> yeah, i was lucky i was always on the stage in one form or another i was very lucky um so um thank you this has been a great conversation uh there's so much more that we could talk about um what I quite ancient. I have a lot of stories. <laughs> a lot of little stories. was there ever a time that you wanted to walk away from what you did was there a time when you got discouraged no like the time when you shifted to more uh, uh more complete solo dramas was that a period where you felt you had to shift away from something or you were just curious about something no i was thinking it's, it this might be a better way of, of taking your art on of taking your all array on right no that makes sense i i have the same kind of arc in my work hmm. last question what do you want to be when you grow up <laughs> oh dear uh i can only i need to say that no i don't know what i want to be i think i'm always going to be a mime and a clown and don't forget, I think you know this, that, that clowns in particular and mimes are really serious people. I think you're right. I think you're so right. I they feel the many things. When I grow up. Not the yeah, 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 yeah. Anybody who does this, this kind of comedy is a serious business and clowning is very serious. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't Thank you, Nola. This has been great. Oh, you had another thought. You had one more thought. Tell us your yeah, thought. It's gone now. <laughs> <laughs> this is what old age I had a thought and it's gone somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I had some of those too in the last few minutes. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. This has been great. Um, Mime Radio Show, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Mime Radio Show. Join us in two weeks for an interview with Carlos Martinez. We'll be posting two interviews, one in English and one in Spanish. Please like and subscribe, and check out our website, mimeradioshow.com.